I'm not even exaggerating when I'm saying that earlier today, just earlier fucking today, I was playing around with parallax mapping, which, if you don't know, takes like a plain texture and adds texture coordinate offset to simulate depth that isn't really there. Either way, I, I will make a tutorial about it. I'm fucking around with that, and then, at least I hear about it today, a new node. Ray Portal BSDF. I don't want to spoil it, so I'm just going to show you what it does. Okay, so here I have a basic scene. Additionally, I've hidden it from you. I have a plane. What do these have in common, you may ask? And what does the Ray Portal BSDF have to do with it? Well, here comes the big reveal. What? <laughs> Are you telling me that I just created a duplicate of the same scene in a single face? Yes. Look at this. This is what the, the Ray Portal BSDF is all about, messing around with like space itself. And with a bit of math, I can change where the camera is, even doing a cross section relative to this plane. So it can look like it's significantly below the surface, somewhat below the surface or something like that. This is literally parallax mapping, but not really so. I found it topical. I'm in 4.2 alpha, it's a new feature. You gotta make sure you're in cycles. This is a cycles only effect at the moment. Okay, so this is my basic scene. Let's create kind of like this ray portal plane. So this can be any object. In the material, I'm going to get rid of this and add a ray portal. I view it and then Huh? <laughs> no, nothing's interesting's happening. In fact, it's actually exactly the same as a transparent BSDF when you do not change the settings except for you can tint kind of this like window. The name of the game is figuring out what direction and position do and figuring out how to exploit them. I think the best way to introduce this is with an analogy. So I want you to look at these incoming vector coordinates. There's a coordinate system that basically you can almost see like there's a world underneath the this plane that gives us these results, right? So if we can understand the incoming vector, we can maybe hope to understand the other. So I want you to imagine that there is a camera and it is viewing the surface here. This vector is kind of what we call incoming. Really incoming goes from the shading point to the camera, but we multiply it by negative one. Incoming is kind of like the coordinate system that is dependent on where the camera is. If we look from this angle, we look at the vector that that goes to that shading point. Now it's like a different arrow. It turns out there's this coordinate system that changes depending where you look at it from. If I take my incoming and scale it by negative one, so this time it goes from camera to shading point and I connect it to direction, you're gonna notice that nothing changes. In fact, by default, this is using the negative incoming vector, which gives us a hint as to what direction means. Direction is saying, where are we looking from? And then position is gonna say, where are we? I don't only want to know which direction the camera is looking at it from, but where was this point to begin with? And it turns out that these two pieces of information are everything. Again, direction is the negative incoming and position is actually the position. However, nobody's saying we have to use these two, right? We have nodes. So I want you to picture the scenario where we kind of have a portal, but I do not want to use these default settings. In fact, picture this as if the plane itself was somewhere different, like we moved it up or down or something like that. All we need to do is we take the position where we're saying the shading points are, and I can lie a little. I can say, eh, maybe they're a little up or down. And all of a sudden, you can see the transformations happening. And now, now you're starting to see a little of what's going on here. If I move it out of the way, it's no longer there. However, if I move it down like the Y axis, we can fiddle around with the Y axis until it shows up. And now you can kind of tell the idea of what's going on here. So we have access to two pieces of information. Where is the shading point? And then the second one is where do we claim we're looking from? So we can already lie about where we are, can we also lie about where we are looking from? So at the moment, what we have is a camera in 3D space and it's actually shooting out rays from a single point. So it kind of creates this kind of like cone or triangle of a uh, field of view. Instead, let's say we look directly down. So we somehow have this orthographic, infinitely high up in the sky perspective, where again, this isn't the same as having a camera above looking down because then every point has a bit of perspective and field of view. No, I want to look 
directly down. For the direction, we're not gonna use the default incoming by negative one. Instead, I'm literally gonna hardwire this direction, look down by negative one. And you can see all of the sudden, let's look back and forth. We have just created orthographic using a kind of like one direction of viewing without any perspective. Again, this is gonna be kind of locked to position, but notice that when I look around the scene now, right, this is almost like a texture like pasted on here because regardless of where we're looking from it's not dependent on it right we don't care about the incoming anymore it's literally just always 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 going to look down if i change the position you're going to see this is where it matters and also uh, the rotation. Let's take this up a another step. This time I'm going to make a cube around this. So this doesn't have to be just a single face. By the way, what I'm about to show you is a trick from Ben BBN19. Let's have each of our faces kind of look inwards. So this top face is going to look downwards into our monkey, is going to look this way, and basically every single face is going to face towards the origin. In other words, we're going to take our normals and we are going to invert them. So remember, incoming scaled by negative one is just going to look as if, you know, this wasn't even here. I'm going to swap incoming with normal. And now we have orthographic views from all six sides, kind of creating a cube map here. And we get that. And we can also rotate the plane on which it's sitting to get all kinds of kind of like novel perspectives. Okay, let's take this even a step further. If we're looking inwards by the negative normal, kind of like a natural thing to try is instead of a cube that has six sides, what if we have infinitely many sides, right? I'm gonna make a sphere that goes all the way around this. So I'm adding an icosphere. Notice, by the way, how weird this is looking, kind of like a infinite glitched out landscape. We're gonna take this, I'm going to shade smooth. And now you can see we're getting kind of like a spherical orthographic view. I'm gonna get rid of that checkerboard plane. So now we just have Suzanne in here. Okay, let me center this on Suzanne. Now gives us this kind of like spherized version. We can also go in between perspectives. So I'm going to mix these two vectors. Luckily in both of these cases, we're multiplying by negative one anyways. And now what we've done is we've created a transformation that can spherize any single object. If I put a, a checkerboard texture on this and I'm gonna make it relative to UV, coordinates. It's fully tied into these UVs. And now if we look through our kind of like mirror dimension, that can uh, stretch as well. Okay, so I'm back to this kind of like orthographic downwards projection. However, our position kind of updates live. So the next order of business is how do I like take this little card with me as if I'm viewing the camera on a little TV screen? Well, you'll notice that as we move our plane, we are literally changing the position coordinates. So here you can see that in action. But in a way, I almost do not want to change the position coordinates so that we can bring them with me. So it needs to be invariant. If we look at some of our options, and there are many, we have generated coordinates, which seem to kind of behave the correct way. Um, so does UV. Object coordinates is interesting. As a first attempt, let's try to use object coordinates because again, it has the nice property where it's centered on the origin. You're going to notice that there's no blue component because this object, since it's an object space, basically thinks that it's always on the XY plane. This is accurate. You can see it's actually reflecting the position coordinates, but the moment I move it, 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 doesn't know that it's moved, right? It's always, always, always on the origin. We can actually use this to our advantage because this is basically the plane being on the ground and then we just shift it up a little. And when we take it with us, right? At this point, when we use object coordinates, it's not gonna know that we even moved it. So we kind of get everything we want. I'm going to take object coordinates, which are gonna look weird. What's happening is it's on the XY plane, which exactly cuts this monkey in half. I I want to move it upwards as if this plane was here because again it thinks it's on the xy plane and i'm gonna add like five units to it you can see it's kind of doing this downwards projection whereas now I can take this with me. So now I have this little viewing card. However, this does not work with rotation, but in terms of location, I have this nice little viewing card. You can just kind of open up your window of what you can view, and then you can scale this down. And you can think of this as basically like a animated window, an orthographic window uh, that you can take with you. 
Awesome. Okay, so now let's try to take a swing at fixing this rotation issue. So remember, I can move my card, I can scale it, but rotating it actually kind of changes the perspective. And why is this rotation an issue? Well, it's not really because of the object coordinates. Remember, they just come along for the ride. It doesn't matter what you do to this uh, coordinate system. No, the issue is we are trying to look straight downwards using this orthographic normal minus one idea. The normal of this is always going to up Date as we kind of rotate it. Ugh. So what's the solution? Well, one solution is we can just say explicitly, explicitly look downwards. Doesn't matter what we do. Um, that is one solution. But I do want to give you kind of a more general solution in case you do want to use the inverted normals in case you have kind of like more than uh, one face going on here. So now we have kind of like two perspectives. Again, you have to imagine that this is hovering above and now we're also taking a plane going uh, this way. We're good with moving, but we are not good with rotating and we can't say look down because we have two different normals. Well, let's look at the normal. Here are our normals. You can see they're pointing outwards. And as we rotate this mesh, you can see that the normals are updating accordingly, right? So they're pointing up and to the right. Now they're pointing in these new directions. The normals are rotating, but they're doing it together. In fact, if I rotate this on the x-axis by, let's say, 38 degrees, if I want to say, imagine that those normals never changed, Ray Portal, like, ah, don't be invariant to rotation. Well, all we need to do is then rotate it backwards by 38 degrees. So anything we do, we kind of invert it to counterbalance this kind of thing, is we can do a vector rotate. I'm gonna set this to Euler because it's kind of the fastest way to do it. And if we rotate by 38 degrees, I'm gonna put that in right here and I'm gonna click invert. You can see that this actually uh, fixed the issue. However, if I rotate more, now it's like, let's say roughly 60 degrees, I have to type it each time. You probably already know where I'm going with this. I can right click. I can copy driver, paste driver. You can see it's rotation invariant, but only on the X axis. Copy is new driver, paste driver, paste driver. Well, now this is not only positionally invariant, but it's also rotationally invariant. So we get this little thing that we can take with us. In fact, I'm going to replace this mesh with basically a cube here. So now we have our like six sided projection. Let me just scale this this bad boy down a little so it's occupying more of the space. Well, now we can take kind of like our six-sided die and, you know, have it. But now let's ask kind of the biggest question in my opinion, which is how do we take kind of like this perfect window? Again, it's using the default and coming by negative one. How do we take this perfect kind of view that has perspective and everything and take it with us, right? We have tricks to do all sorts of things, but the projection for this one ultimately depends on incoming. So we can't use the normal tricks with the rotating or anything like this. Because this is view dependent, we again care about where the camera is. So it's shooting out rays. What happens if I take this plane and rotate it? Well, you can see all of the sudden, these lines are kind of like intersecting in different places. We've changed the entire game. We would have needed to rotate the camera with this plane so that like it's kind of like tagging along for the ride. And then I rotate it even more and now the camera needs to be over here. We don't have that luxury because I'm viewing where I'm viewing from. So what we need to do is we need to take this income coming vector and somehow redefine it in a way where if we rotate it, it comes along for the ride and it always knows what shading point we're talking about. This is exactly what tangent space is about. So this is gonna be a bit above the pay grade, but I just wanna show you that it's possible. If this is our incoming vector, it turns out that there's a special transformation matrix. Take our incoming and make it invariant to how we like rotate or move this is composed of three vectors in the same way that kind of like the world space matrix is composed of the X axis, the Y axis and the Z axis, right? It's these arrows, but they're special. The first of these is tangent. And I don't mean 
um, this tangent over here that actually calculates it cylindrically. So you'll see if I uh, view this, it will look exactly the same. No, I'm talking about tangents that are dependent on the UV map, dependent on how we rotate our UVs. You're going to notice by default, it's red, indicating that we're going up on the x-axis. In UV space, you can think of as kind of like pointing right as we rotate it, I guess, this way. It becomes fully green, indicating that it's going up on the y-axis, which makes sense because we just rotated the thing. The second vector you've probably never heard of, and it's called bitangent. It's basically the combination of the tangent and the normal. You take the cross product of the tangent and the normal. So this is our first one. We have tangent. Our second one is something called the bitangent. And uh, the third one is actually the uh, normal. One of them is the normal that's pointing outwards on the three-dimensional surface. And then the other two are basically defined locally on the surface to flow with the UV map, right? But at the tip of the ear, like uh, here, for example, the normal is pointing this way. And now the tangent and bitangent are pointing different ways. So unlike a world or an object coordinate system, this one is local. We can then take our incoming and then transform it using this kind of matrix. We can't actually have a matrix and shading nodes, just a bunch of vectors. The best we can do is take the three components of this tangent matrix and multiply them one by one. In matrix multiplication, if you've taken linear algebra, all you have to do is for each um, pairing, you take the dot product. So first we take the dot product of tangent and our incoming. Second of all, we take the dot product of our bitangent and our incoming. And then third of all, we take the <laughs> dot product of our normal, which we got to make sure is actually normal and our incoming. So we've done kind of three multiplications, which could kind of compel you to turn it into a vector. So basically we just did a matrix multiplication by hand. So I'm going to connect this over here. Maybe the best way to think about this is that this is a node group and you can think of this node group as basically a converter and converts it to tangent space. By the way, I think I got this cross product crossed up. So just invert that. And just like before, even though this kind of handles our uh, rotation. We want to make sure we know where this is in space, even if we kind of like move it off to the side. This is well behaved when we pretend that it's on the ground plane using object coordinates. And then we just move it up a little. So we're just kind of combining our tricks here. So let's say it's on the ground plane and then we move it four units up. This is going to be our position. We view this. By the way, you should probably apply scale. Um, so now we have this little thing that we can move around, but we can also rotate it this time. And uh, if I kind of play with this number, you can think of this as the depth in the scene. So let me put this down here. Now we kind of have our copy that we can rotate and view the way you would expect that works in nice little tangent space. So again, it was very ironic that this thing came out, maybe it came out a day or two ago, but it came out right after I finished my parallax mapping thing. By the way, you should pick it up. I'll do a tutorial on it. Not dependent on a height map, which is good in some ways, bad in others. There you go. New node. Hopefully this helped explain it or made you even more confused.